Hi, I'm Kaylin Marcotte, and I beat the often path by putting a unique spin on a timeless classic, supporting emerging artists, and pitching my heart out on Shark Tank. Welcome back to the Beat the Often Path podcast. I'm your host, Ross Palmer. On this show, we showcase out-of-the-box success stories to help us reevaluate our lives and careers and to see the puzzle <laughs> of our lives in a new light. Well, guess what, folks? My guest today is Kaylin Marcotte, and she took her strange passion and turned it into a multi-million dollar business. What was her brilliant idea that got her 500K in funding from Mark Cuban on Shark Tank? If you guessed... Boutique jigsaw puzzles. Ding, 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 ding. You are correct. We'll learn how Kaylin made a series of super smart decisions at exactly the right time to catapult her business forward during the pandemic, a time that saw many businesses close their doors and some for good, unfortunately. Her story represents everything that I love and value on this show, so buckle up for a great conversation full of inspiration and laughy, laughy good times. Here's Kaylin Marcotte founder of Jiggy Puzzles. Welcome to the show, Kaylin. It's so great to have you here. Thank you for joining me. Thanks so much, Ross. I'm excited to talk to you today. So first off, we have to say, do the, do the kids still say getting jiggy with it? Is that something? <laughs> yeah, Is that still hip? They do. That is definitely um, something we have, you know, steered clear of any copyright issues, but <laughs> used in our marketing a bit. <laughs> the kids may say yeah. that, but we do not. <laughs> and by kids, I mean 40-year-old uh, millennials, obviously. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yes. Okay. So you leaned into something unusual. You found a weird part of your personality. Well, it's not that weird, but it's weird for the purposes of our discussion. You found a weird yeah. hobby, interest, and you leaned into it at a very precarious time. And that's the origin yeah. of your new business. So let's talk a bit about the time. When did this thing it begin is. and how and why? Yeah, so the company launched in 2019, but the story kind of started um, probably five years before that. I started a new job. I joined an early startup media company called The Skim, and I met the co-founders. I was their first employee. So it was just like the super like gritty, meaty days, ton of responsibility and total creativity, which was awesome, but also all consuming. I just screens all day long, really kind of that first um, startup experience and the pace and everything. So burning out and was looking for just a way to unplug. I would, you know, be on my phone and computer all day and then come home and turn on the TV. And I was like, this is more of the same and I don't feel relaxed. And so, um, I had, you know, done puzzles as a kid. I wasn't a fanatic, but, um, my family loved like game nights and, and puzzles. So certainly had done them. And I kind of just randomly had one lying around did a puzzle and it clicked immediately. It was um, very stress relieving and meditative for me. I think just the the one track mind focus on this task in front of me totally forgot, you know, all the pings, notifications, stimuli, like quieted my mind. And so I started doing a thousand piece puzzle pretty much every week. Um, so that's a little weird. I became the puzzle girl. I posted all my completed ones, <laughs> you know, just on like my Instagram and all my friends were like, wow, Kaylin's really into puzzles. Um, but I was doing a thousand piece puzzle a week. And so I was always looking for more, you know, buying more, shopping online, going to toy stores. And all the ones I could find were like grandma's puzzles, super outdated, cheesy stock photography, same two part box. And so the, the idea that planted was just how could these be better? What if I got to dream up a puzzle? What would I want to be different about the experience? And so that was really 2014, 2015. Um, but I ended up staying at the skim for four years and and then started working on on actually building out Jiggy in 2018 and launched the next year. 
Amazing. Well, I love that the two-part box was somehow a problem for you. Of all the things I would have considered, like that dang two-part box. Uh, I had never considered the box of a jigsaw puzzle to be a problem, but it's apparently like they it is. They all look the same. They all yeah, look the same. Like, That's on, true. Somebody mix it I up. Don't consider, <laughs> I don't consider myself a puzzle expert by any means, but I have noticed anecdotally that they are all, in fact, the same. That's true. Mm-hmm. And before we jump into that, I want to talk about another thing that you said, because there is this thing, and this is by no means a new thought, but there is this thing that we work all day. I certainly do this. I have a digital marketing agency, and the startup that you're talking about is my own company, and I'm working 14 hours a day on a computer, terrible things, getting tendonitis in my arm, typing, 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 computer screen, computer screen. And then afterwards, you go home, and then you say, I'm going to watch a bigger screen for a little while, right. and that's my <laughs> relaxation. But, oh, we don't stop there. Because you have to have your littlest screen right. in your hand while you're watching the biggest. I'm scrolling through Reddit while I've got a movie on, half paying attention. And you say, what am I doing? And then a friend says, hey, you need to get a Nintendo Switch because video right. games are a way to relax. I say, uh, I don't think I need to inject yet another screen into my life. Exactly. So exactly. I love the idea of doing anything that gets us away from those notifications and the pings and the dings of Slack and mail and messages and teams and all of that stuff. So super cool. Yeah. So you found the zen of Thank you. puzzling and it changed yes. your life. And I think I did. And, and you know, I tried yoga and like meditation apps and just nothing stuck. And then it was almost had the opposite effect of I'm like, why aren't I relaxed? Why isn't the, isn't this supposed to be calming? Why am I not? What's wrong with me? Am I too type A for yoga? What's happening? And so I think with a puzzle and it is funny to see who like is attracted to puzzles. I think there is something about you know, being not necessarily a type A, but like a very like goal oriented person of like, I want to relax, but I also want to see progress and I want there to be a right answer and I want the pieces to fit, you know? And yes. like, so it yes. really achieved, like, it was what I needed to actually kind of mentally check out to, to still like have a task at hand. It's a challenge within a two part box, if you will. Um, <laughs> But part of my fascination with puzzles, anybody who knows me in real life, so you were known as the puzzle girl. I was known as the Rubik's Cube guy in <laughs> yes. high school. So the same thing that happened with me, I had a bad knee injury. I, soccer was my life. I played soccer in high school. I had the unhappy triad, ACL, MCL, Oof. meniscus tear. Oof. You know, you're never going to run for a while, surgery. Uh. And I was in a machine that bent and straightened my leg just over and oh, over God, again for yeah. 10 hours a day. And this was pre-internet as we know it today. Um, So I was watching TV and movies all day. And at a certain point, I went insane. I just couldn't handle watching another TV show, another movie. So I looked for anything around me. And kind of similar to your story, my dad had a junk drawer with all this crap. And in it was a Rubik's Cube from 1980-something. And yeah. I have always loved puzzles. I was always able to solve any puzzle that was ever given to me. Those little contraptions. Here's the horseshoe, the rings, all of those things. People right, were right. given to me as gifts. I'd solve it within five minutes and they'd say, oh, dang it. Like you got that one too. So I was right. like, I'll solve this Rubik's cube. And then I just couldn't. And then it went, drove mm. me insane that I couldn't mm. solve this, couldn't solve it. So I got a pen and paper and I worked it out and I had this little guide, but it wasn't a solution until I finally solved it after weeks or whatever. And then I became a competitive speed cuber where Whoa. nobody was doing this. I tried to get my time faster and faster. This was completely unknown to the world except for like <laughs> 10 people, one in South Korea, one in the Netherlands, one in the UK. And we'd have our little online weekend forums helping each other solve this thing. Now it's a phenomenon. Oh my God. Yeah. So I was, but it's the same kind of thing where I would bring this cube and sheets of algorithms with me to class every day at school. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's like, I need to get better at this, but also <laughs> there needs to be a solution and it needs to be very right, clear. Right. And it is a cube. It's just not two dimensional, but the idea is very much the same. And to this day, exactly. I think of it as a Zen kind of practice as well. Mm-hmm. Because it's it doesn't require batteries. You can take mm-hmm. it with you. You can do it mm-hmm. camping. You can do it literally anywhere. You can take it on a plane. Now puzzles, jigsaw puzzles are a little bit different. Mm-hmm. But I also had a very similar experience to you. Yeah, that's awesome. That's I actually went to high school with a guy who was very he he moved from Japan. I grew up in LA. Um it, Maki Makasumi, if you ever heard of him, but he would he was a competitive speed cuber 
And he, every year in our talent show, would do another crazy thing with his Rubik's Cube. One time he was juggling in one hand and solving <laughs> right. it in the other. You know, he'd, he'd look at it for however long, blindfold, and do it blindfolded and all these things. Um, but, yeah, I think very much the same kind of thing it taps into. And um, I think for for people who, whatever, always thinking on, you know, very busy minded or, or, um, or need a way to quiet that. I actually have a friend who tragically, she lost her, both of her parents in a very short span. And so works with a grief community and, um, they've recommended puzzles as a way to, to almost like in a healthy way versus like, you know, a destructive behavior, like kind of distract yourself from your thoughts and, um, and help pass the time a bit. We heard from customers during COVID who were quarantining alone and, you know, experiencing a lot of loneliness that, um, a way to kind of pass time, um, healthfully, productively, but that kind of was an escape from your own thoughts, um, was something that was, that was helpful for them. So yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting and very rewarding to see all the ways that, um, having a habit or a practice like that can impact people. Yeah. And, and you touch on two things that I value very much in this show. First of all, making lemonade from lemons, as it were, succeeding in a downturn, finding a, a thing that can be successful during a horrible time. That's one thing. And the other is, of course, leaning into your unique passion and turning it into a business mm -hmm. or something that actually yeah. makes you money. So you, your story fits both of those. So you yeah. started in 2014. You knew that you had this interest. You knew that those damn boxes were a problem that must be solved. <laughs> But it took you five years to put it together, <laughs> to put that puzzle yeah. together. And in 2019, yeah. you actually launched a business. So what were the first steps that you took to launch that business? Yeah. So I had, again, it had been, you know, years while I was still at the skim. So it was definitely a slow burn on um, just putting together the idea and having it take more shape. And, you know, it started with just, I want a better puzzle experience. And so, okay, what are the... Um, what are the uh, layers of that one being the art itself? So I remember the one when I finally was like, I need to do something about this. It was, you know, like a stock photography that was kind of, kind of etched illustrated of a bunch of fishing tackle. And it was just like fishing rods and, and wires and, you know, hooks and bait just splayed out on a table and I was like, I'm spending 12 hours doing with this image. Like I am immersed in this image for hours upon hours. I'm like, I don't want to look at this. And so the, you know, kind of prompt number one was the art itself. And how do, how do I create a puzzle that you want to immerse yourself in and are, are drawn to and enjoy studying every detail as you look at every piece and so um, that was question number one. And I, I grew up in L.A. My mom founded an arts nonprofit when I was a kid. And so I was oh, just grew up surrounded by the art community and saw not only one, how much amazing talent there is out there and how much incredible work there would be to source from, but two, how hard it is to monetize. And unless you kind of really get in that 1% of, you know, um, gallery or, or representation, you know, art dealers, someone, these, these tastemakers and gatekeepers in the art world choosing you, it's really hard to, to actually make a living out of your work. So kind of aha moment. Number one was, was bringing those two passions together and, um, and deciding that the model with, with Jiggy would be partnering with licensing from emerging artists and um, doing a profit sharing model. So they get a percentage of every sale. Um, so that was step number one. And then, you know, pain point two for my puzzle experience was what do I do with this thing once it's done? You know, you, you spend so much time putting it together and then, you, you know, puzzles, completed jigsaw puzzles are pretty large or like, you know, 18, 24 inches. So you essentially have a print, you know, you have an art print of this work. Um, I was too sentimental to tear it apart right away. 
So I would just like stack them on top of each other completed and like slide it under my couch. But, um, you know, the thinking was, wait a second, we're the whole point is we're actually making beautiful puzzles with these artists' original work. So the idea for puzzle glue and to basically turn each jiggy into a puzzle kit um, that includes puzzle glue. Once it's done, you put it on the top and it dries clear in between the pieces, basically binding them so that you can move it around, frame it, display it. Um, so that was kind of piece two. And then and then back to that box, I was like, all right, we got to do it differently. How are we displaying this? How can I create more of kind of an experience in presenting the puzzle and, and you know, imagined an upright box, um, kind of a nod to like a museum, kind of pedestal shaped, square, white, very thick, you know, somebody called us the apple of puzzle, you know, that very thick very um, nice. white materials and... Um, and then everything's reusable, didn't want to use plastic. So the pieces come in a glass jar with a cork lid, a tube of puzzle glue, a, a straight edge tool. <laughs> Actually, talk about weird, a funny story on the tool. So, you know, I had the idea for the glue and I was like, how do you apply the glue? How do you get the glue on? How do you spread it? Basically, you know, you need a way to, to not have it dry on the surface of the puzzle and get kind of crusty, but just get in between the pieces uh, those like grooves themselves. And so I, nobody, there was no like commercialized productized puzzle glue, but there was a very avid Reddit community who glued all of their puzzles. Of course there <laughs> and is. so there, so they all traded tips. Like, how do you glue it? You know, I was imagining like a paint roller almost, but then it yeah. leaves like brush strokes and you can kind of, it's like textured still. So that didn't work. And so I, a guy named Randy on this Reddit just posted a video <laughs> of him gluing his puzzle and he just dumped glue and then used like his credit card or his driver's license and spread it. And I was like, of course, all you need is like a straight edge tool, you know, that can, that can spread it cleanly and get it in between <laughs> the cracks. So that's how we, we developed our um, jiggy like glue tool and... Um, yeah, so kind of the art, the the glue, and then the packaging were the three um, kind of first pieces that that I developed and worked on and started doing those while I was still working full time. I didn't want to go out and raise money, and so um, decided to bootstrap and just sell fund it. And um, so kept working, developing all of that, and then. Uh, once we found a, a factory partner, which was a whole whole another thing, and then went into production, um, I I quit and decided to dive in full time. Did you have proof of concept at the time that you quit, or was it very much a leap of faith? Uh, I had, I would say the things that did give me confidence were um, a bit more, not necessarily proof of concept for Jiggy, but just kind of more macro trends. I think seeing like the adult coloring books and a lot of just like DIY kind of crafting Pinterest. I was like, all right, I, I don't have a direct comp, but I feel like the, these indicate an appetite. There was a lot of conversation around you know, millennials are the burnout generation was one headline. And so it's like, all right, I think there's enough here that I can pull it together um, in this new way that would, would give me conviction. And then really just talking about it with people, telling friends and family, doing it. I'm a solo founder. So doing it alone, I, I needed that kind of, um, people to reflect back to me, like excitement or support for it to kind of give me more energy to keep going. And so, you know, I had talked about it with a bunch of people. I reached a point where I was like, all right, even if the, no one bites and there's no appetite for this, like, I think I can sell a couple hundred just from people I know. So like worst case, you know, I'm, I'm out there just selling them to friends and family and then I go get another job. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, did you have any kind of safety net saved from your job before you undertook this? Uh, no, I did. So I, I, let's see, I graduated undergrad with student loans. I did a management consulting for one year to pay off all those loans. And 
then nice. jump to the skim. So yes, I would. I, Twelve months of management consulting was definitely worth a clean, clean slate um, for for student debt. And then went to the skim, which you know was they did a seed round when I joined. Um, so weren't paying you know big salaries, but was able to save a little there, and then. Um, I consulted with some other startups. I left the skim, was working on Jiggy, but consulting with other startups. Um, so no, I didn't have much of a safety net, but I also, I think I'm, I'm an optimist in some ways where I was, my thinking was just, if this doesn't work, like I'm young enough and I'm employable enough <laughs> I, someone will hire me and, and I'll just start, start the nest egg over. Yeah. Right. How long did it take before you realized that you were onto something? Was it immediate success or a bit um, of a struggle at the beginning? Well, timing helped. So I launched beginning of November. So going straight into holidays, which is not only just, you know, peak, um, peak purchasing time anyway, but also for puzzles specifically, a lot of people, you know, have associations of they do one around the table with their family at Thanksgiving or Christmas, a lot of gifting, especially because we've positioned uh, Jiggy as more premium and the presentation and packaging, um, you know, the, the percentage going to the artist it is at a higher price point than other puzzles, but very giftable. And so we went straight into holidays. Is this, um, which, this is November 2019? Exactly. Yeah. So did you cause COVID in order to boost your sales? <laughs> is that the master plan? That stroke of genius I number know. three? Everyone's like, everyone who had seen me this whole, they're like, you've been thinking about starting a puzzle company <laughs> for five and a half years and you ended up doing it four months before COVID. So it, it was crazy timing. It def, you know, it brought a lot of demand. It also brought a lot of supply chain and freight and everything got more complicated and more expensive. And, you know, I had only ever done anything once to launch. And so going back into production and all of a sudden, you know, costs shoot up timelines for production double. Um, so it was, it was a mixed bag, but it brought, so much attention for, you know, a product that nobody, you know, press influencers, celebrities, like all these people who probably never would have talked about puzzles, like were open and curious. Um, so, so yeah, it brought a lot of opportunity. Um, but I think the first time, I mean, definitely seeing strangers order the first time I was like, Oh, I don't know any of these people. <laughs> like that's awesome. And, and then actually pretty quickly on, um, anthropology found us, I think just like on Instagram and reached out. I drove over to Philly and pitched them and they placed our first like large wholesale retail order. Ooh. So doing, um, getting into anthropology and then seeing it, you know, on shelves across the country was, was very cool. Awesome. And you're still working with the prints from artists that you knew from LA or were they different artists at that point? Yeah. So I started, you know, going to art fairs and shows and, and curating for, you know, not all art is going to make a great puzzle. There needs to be enough color and detail and, you know, layers and, and saturation for it to be fun. We have put out a couple with like large, you know, um, areas of one color, more kind of gradient. And, and so when people are up for a challenge, those can be fun. But for the most part, you know, I, I tried to look at all the art in the lens of would this be fun to puzzle and, and will it look cool when it's all complete and, and ready to glue and frame. Um, so I started curating from my own network and LA people, and then I'm based in New York. So going to art fairs and shows in New York. And so the first couple collections were people I found and went out to and, you know, wasn't sure how they were going to respond if it was like silly or just not like a use of their work they had imagined, but there was a lot of excitement for it. I think especially 
artists who wanted wanted their work to be engaged with and interacted with and not just you know viewed but um the idea of of a puzzler you know almost like co-creating with them and and having a hand in in putting it together and of course you literally are looking at every detail so the appreciation you have for the work um i think when you're studying it so intently uh is a very different experience but so much great response and artists who were who were interested. So those first couple collections I curated. And then after that, and since we've been live and gotten some press, we have a lot of artists reaching out to us. So we have like an open submission process as well. At what point did you decide to go on Shark Tank? When did you think that that was the right idea? Yeah, I, uh, so it turns out about a third of the companies that go on the show are scouted. So they're producers, you know, out there looking for, for new brands all the time. And so they contacted me actually pretty soon after launch and before COVID, I think it was end of January, February of 2020. And, um, you know, I wasn't sure. I was like, I have so much going on again. I'm a solo founder. Uh, I know it's a huge opportunity, also a huge time investment. And I'm just kind of sprinting um, and and then COVID hit and we sold out. And I was like, all right, this might actually be such a, an opportunity I can't pass up in terms of one, the, the platform and the visibility. And um, if this, you know, there's more attention on puzzles, if this could, could you know, reach millions of, of more potential customers, then that seems like good use of, of my yeah. time. And then also I was like, you know, I am doing this alone. We're sold out having a potential partner or, or, uh, you know, influx of capital to really, um, double down would, was something I started considering. So decided to go on, you know, did the whole, uh, being scouted gets you past like the cold, the blind auditions, if you will, but then doing all the videos and, um, and refining the pitch and everything. And ultimately I did it. I filmed still, you know, end of summer, 2020. So pre-vaccine, very strict production guidelines. I, we all had to live in a hotel room for the full 14 days. Um, and because of COVID, they didn't allow guests or anything. So I'm a solo founder. So I quarantined in this hotel room. Literally they walk you to your door, close the door. It does not open again. You know, they deliver you three Ugh. meals a day. <laughs> it doesn't open again. So it was, I had plenty of time to practice and rehearse and had all my friends on Zoom <laughs> pretending to be the sharks and grilling me. And, Fingernails um, grown out, scraggly <laughs> hair. Like, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a custom heart on a jigsaw puzzle. It's custom right. heart on a jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> and it's sustainable well, packaging. Sorry. The packaging is different. No more two-part boxes. <laughs> They're like, like, okay, how calm is this going to work? They <laughs> like put us in holes for two, for 14 days. And then the next time we interact with people is in front of cameras and lights right. and all. And I was like, yeah, we're like cavemen, like emerging like torture and like, thrown in stuff of a camera. Um, but ultimately went well. Um, and uh, yeah, the show, I think they're, they're the things that I predicted happening from the show of um, you know, just the platform they have and the, the Shark Tank viewer base is so supportive and like really wants these companies to succeed and cheer you on. Um, so that was, was great. And then, you know, a lot of other people watch the show, like partners, retailers, other investors. And so just the kind of tangential opportunities and, and um, things that the show brings was, was very cool. So it definitely kind of set, set us up on a different path. Well, you got the best possible outcome because Mark Cuban invested 500K, mm -hmm. pretty sweet. Mm -hmm. And you said it changed mm -hmm. the trajectory of everything. So what changed from that moment? How did it the business evolved. Yeah. The big, I mean, definitely, I think you, um, it, it just creates a little more space and just more kind of room to, to think big, to kind of throw out those, what if, you know, uh, ideas. And so I've kept, you know, the team is still super small or we're, we're scrappy and, 
uh, and lean and, and I care a lot about still doing things, um, that with the mission and doing things the way that we were anyway, and not, I think sometimes, you know, people think investment and you come in and you, you know, slash costs. And certainly some of the decisions we make do not make sense if that's what your only priority is, you know, profit sharing with these artists pretty generously and, you know, the quality, the, the, the price of our materials and all of that. But, um, I, it definitely opened a lot of opportunity, you know, again, the people who watch the show and the network that the show has built over the past 14 years, um, of, just having, there's a person for everything. And so I think that's the biggest, instead of me like, oh, maybe we should consider, you know, performance marketing. What do we do there? Like there is a, um, there is an expert and a person and kind of a network um, for everything. There's uh, between, between you and the shark, if you have an investment and also between just like the alumni of the, of the show. Mm. Um, and so there's actually a reunion in, in September of Ooh. Shark Tank companies and everyone, you know, shares best practices and what they're doing and trying. And so it does kind of feel like you, you get invited into this family. Uh, and now another interesting topic that we haven't covered is the, you've got artists from all around the world now. Yeah. So not just New York, not just LA. How did you start getting involved yeah. in other countries? Because you've got Africa, you've got uh, Eastern yeah. Europe, all over the map. How did yeah. you begin expanding your, was it just people reaching out to you saying, we, I want to be a part of this? A little bit of both. Definitely opening up our, our submission kind of, we had, we have these quarterly, like, open call for art and get a ton of inbound. Um, and then I just always, no matter where I am, what I'm doing, always have my, my eyes open. So found a lot of our artists just on Instagram or through collaborations they did prior. And so I always have that lens, um, and, and really wanted to make sure, you know, right now we have a, we have a, 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 an aesthetic. We have a certain style, but I wanted to make sure that, um, that there was enough, not only kind of diversity representation in the art itself, but of the artist's backgrounds. And so, um, yeah, we have now a ton of artists in, in Europe. We have, um, a couple, one, I'm thinking of Mafalda, she's Mozambican um, now and, and South African. And just all of her work has such a, an amazing different layer and look. And uh, the material, you know, I also wanted different kind of diversity and just the materials that they use because it gives such a, a, a unique experience. We have one who is an oil painter. And so, you know, obviously it's, 2D, it's printed, but like you can see the brush strokes in the oh. art. And so when you, when it's done and framed, it's fun to see people's aha moment where they're like, is that, what, is that a puzzle? And they get closer because there's, you know, if there's texture to it with the puzzle pieces and then the brush strokes on top of it. Um, so yeah, that was, that was very important. And we're actually working pre launch pre-announcement, but we're, we're getting close. So, um, I'd love to share it with you, but we're working on more of essentially like a platform marketplace. We nice. have so many artists who we want to work with, but the model right now is that we release six, a collection, six designs at a time. And so on the artist side, it's just, we, we can't possibly work with everyone we want to doing six at a time. And on the customer side, you know, they, a new collection drops, they're excited, come on, pick the one or two that they like best. And then there's nothing new for, you know, until the next collection next quarter. So the idea for the marketplace is to um, enable artists to come on, you know, select three pieces of their work, upload and essentially create their like mini puzzle shop um, that we power and uh, and can work with a ton more artists and, and bring in a lot more designs because we have requests for more abstract and photography and, and aesthetics that we're not currently covering. So I'm very excited about that, which is coming in September. 
Before we wrap things up, I want to leave the floor to you here. So two things. The first is, is there a piece of unusual advice that you believe that very few other people believe? And then the second is promote whatever you want and close this episode out. Mm. Um, I would say the, the piece of advice that I, I got and did not follow um, were one to kind of keep things close to the vest and to not, sh- you know, stealth mode. And as I kind of mentioned, it was so important for me early on to share the idea and to get feedback and to help hone it and to get energy from it. And, you know, if you're, if you have real IP issues or, or trade secrets, okay, keep those close to the vest. But, um, I think a lot, I think people have ideas that, um, that they're unwilling to, to share. And I actually think that that can be the first step sometimes of just talk people's ears off about it, share the idea, who knows what introduction it'll lead to or way that, you know, new idea or, or way it will hone. So um, I think once once that seedling has started, the idea is incepted um, to start sharing it and iterating on it. Um, and I do think there's a lot, you know, of people with ideas that I wish and would love to see, you know, start smaller, sooner, scrappier. I think um, I'm seeing it change a bit, which is encouraging, but I think the, you know, immediate biggest raise, you know, go out, do the the circuit in San Francisco and that the fundraising is the requisite step, which sometimes that's the case. But I think there are a lot of ideas where starting with what you have and um, and starting smaller and doing it the way you want with the vision you want, um, it can be the first step and then can set you up later if you do need to fundraise with much more power in that dynamic and and more control. So I'd say share the idea, start um, start sooner, and uh, and you know really think about how you can do it yourself before immediately defaults. You know raising and having those vanity metrics of of the biggest round. Um, and then for Jiggy promotion, what I'm really excited about is this, this studio, it's called Jiggy Studio. So this is the marketplace where artists can, can come and share their work that, um, we will turn into an amazing puzzle for you. And, um, we also, any New Yorkers, we're going to be at the Union Square holiday market this holiday season. So come visit us all the in and out, but we'd love to, to meet people there. Um, and then we also just launched Jiggy Junior, which is our kids line. So any, um, any, yeah, families or, uh, or people in need of a distraction for their kids. Um, we have the same model. We source from emerging artists and, and put their work on smaller 100 piece kids puzzles. So Jiggy Junior, um, you know, New York, come check me out in Union Square. And then, Jiggy Studio, um, where you can browse hundreds of work from these artists are, are the big things that I'm excited about. And of course, the main website, JiggyPuzzles.com. Yeah. Yes? JiggyPuzzles.com and social or Jiggy Puzzles on, on all platforms. Very cool. Well, Kaylin Marcotte, thank you very much for joining me. It has been an absolute pleasure. Rock on in the puzzle world. Keep doing your thing. <laughs> You're doing great. Thanks, Rob. You don't need my yeah. approval, but <laughs> awesome <laughs> work. Thank you. Uh, yeah, again, thank you for sitting and sharing your story with me. I, I think it's endlessly fascinating. And uh, with that, thank you. the official fun. podcast is over. Ooh.